In this lecture, I'll be discussing climate change. I'd just like to point out before I get started that there are a number of resources that are available on Bolt uh, that are there uh, to go with this uh, lecture, uh, particularly discussions about uh, perceptions of climate change, including front lines, climate of doubt. Um, there's also a short clip from This American Life, uh, which looks at the um, education of youth in regards to climate change, and a video um, on Shishmaref, uh, losing ground on Shishmaref, Alaska. So uh, overall in this lecture, um, some of the big questions to think about with climate change, uh, much like any environmental issue um, along the lines of political ecology, um, how do we know uh, about the issue? Where does knowledge come from regarding the issue of climate change or any uh, issue, social, ecological issue as a whole. Um, how do we know that climate's changing? What are some of the potential impacts of climate change? And then who is going to bear the burden uh, of those impacts? How might they be uh, disproportionately felt by differently situated individuals? We saw some of the same discussion in the context of both overpopulation as well as issues of food security. Well, what can or should be done in order to confront climate change and who should do it? And this also goes to a discussion of different approaches to environmental issues as, as a whole. And a lot of this is how envir the environment is framed in terms of approaches to environment, how sustainability is conceptualized, and then the best way to get there. So uh, that summarizes the big questions with this uh, piece. and. What I'd like to go into now is uh, an overview of the, some of the elements that we'll be talking about. Uh, first, we'll start with a real general discussion of the difference between weather and climate. Uh, from there, uh, I'll talk about uh, the greenhouse effect. Uh, we'll go into a discussion of greenhouse gas emissions, and we'll look at some of the public opinion on climate change uh, in the United States. This has been measured over the last 20 years with the Gallup polls. Uh, we'll look at some of the influences. Uh, in terms of what actually influences public opinion on climate change, as well as historic, uh, an historic example of uh, opinion on uh, climate change and where uh, climate change comes from and essentially who is to blame for climate change. Uh, finally, I'll conclude with some ethnographic examples uh, primarily focused in the Arctic um, and Alaska, um, which have been called the front lines of uh, the issue of climate change, or at least one of the uh, front lines uh, with the issue of climate change. So the difference between climate and weather. Um, climate uh, is uh, weather essentially of a place averaged over a period of time, often 30 years. Uh, climate information includes statistical weather information that tells us about the normal weather as well as the range of weather extremes for a given location. On the other hand, weather is the day-to-day -day state of the atmosphere and its short-term variation in minutes to weeks. People generally think of weather as the combination of temperature, humidity, precipitation, cloudiness, visibility, and wind. We talk about changes in the weather in terms of the near future. How hot is it right now? What will it be like today? Over the weekend, will we get a snowstorm, a rainstorm? Will it be sunny? Um, and so over the winter of 2013 in mid-latitudes in North America, uh, we saw a pretty dramatic cold season and it left some to speculate that the winter was the worst that they had seen and they really needed more of the global warming around to prevent uh, these brutal winters from happening. In a recent study in September of 2014 uh, Beck Min and co-authors released an article um, titled Weakening of the Stratospheric Polar Vortex by Arctic Sea Ice Loss. And in this article, they make the connection between Arctic sea ice loss and cold winters in the extrapolar regions and how they're dynamically connected to the polar, uh, through the polar stratosphere. Um, essentially, they argue that uh, decrease in sea ice cover during the early winter months between November and December, especially over the Barents and Kara Seas in Russia, 
has led to a weakening of the stratospheric polar vortex in midwinter, uh, January and February. And you can see there to the right uh, the figures. Um, the one to the left is uh, illustrative of November 14th to the 16th, uh, and this shows the polar vortex uh, in a typical compact configuration. Um, however, uh, we can see this compact configuration break down uh, in, over um, in January 5th of 2014. Um, these are from NOAA um, images here, and you can see that the polar vortex is um, not as uh, compact. Um, you can see the declining temperatures uh, that were felt through the mid-latitudes in uh, much of uh, North America and the uh, Midwest and even to the northeastern United States as well. Now many of us have, um, through um, initial schooling, uh, come across something to this effect. Um, looking at the division between uh, the greenhouse effect in its so-called natural state um, and then the human enhanced greenhouse effect. And we can also make arguments uh, about whether in fact, I mean, this is part of that argument of whether humans are a part of nature or apart from nature. And here you can see a very clear dichotomy. Um, indeed, the atmosphere even changes colors. Um, this comes from a fairly typical uh, eighth grade um, classroom uh, education pro uh, project uh, looking at the enhancement of the greenhouse effect by human interactions with the environment as a whole. And so a lot of these uh, materials for the greenhouse effect and global warming uh, have been developed by individuals interested in bringing science into the classroom and educating uh, both middle and high school students in the United States along the lines of scientific literacy. And that, that is actually what the, This American Life, that short um, audio clip, goes through uh, and talks about a little bit the difficulties in, in, in attempting to convince um, uh, essentially um, teenagers uh, about the um, accuracy of climate change. Um, we can see with the um, the models here are relatively uh, simplistic uh, in relation to all the factors that atmospheric scientists must consider and climatologists as they model um, climate change um, in, in, into um, the future and look at the potential detrimental impacts of um, climate change as a whole. Regarding the question of uh, who's responsible for climate change, uh, we can see that uh, if, as the scientific consensus would argue, uh, with 97 to 98 percent of scientists having consensus on uh, change in climate, um, we can see that this is certainly going to have some impact on everyday life. But the question uh, remains, of course, um, if we have, if we consider the greenhouse gas emissions by country as a primary indicator of human-induced climate change or anthropogenic-induced uh, climate change, uh, then we also must consider the ramifications of who bears the burden of responsibility of climate change. And if you look at this figure, it's uh, fairly uh, indicative here of uh, a illustration of the responsibility of the United States and China, um, as well as uh, India, um, that you can see uh, disproportionately represented on the map, along with much of uh, Western Europe and Eastern Europe as well, producing massive quantities of greenhouse gas emissions. And it's, you know, particularly evident when you look at, uh, by illustration, to Canada, for example, for the for the United States. Uh, it's also interesting to note that this is total greenhouse gas emissions by a country, uh, but that this does not necessarily align with per capita uh, emissions. As uh, this is 2006 data here, and during that time, Qatar was the uh, number one country for um, climatic uh, or greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, per capita. So in the United States, um, the Gallup polls have been conducted um, roughly uh, over uh, the last uh, couple of uh, decades on the issues of um, global warming and climate change. And uh, 
the statements are, are fairly interesting and the responses to them are fairly interesting as well. You could see um, dips within public opinion regarding climate change. I should point out the Gallup polls are fairly well known for being accurate in regards to overall public opinion of issues. Um, we can see a decline of um, the uh, interest in uh, global warming from 63 uh, percent who say that they worry a great deal to a fair amount about global warming. Um, now this could be looked at on a Likert scale, great, a great deal would be a four, a fair amount would be a three, only a little would be two, and uh, or not at all would be a one. Um, you know, it raises interesting questions about how the data was mixed here in terms of the Gallup poll, and it would be interesting to parse out the information about how many people worry about climate change uh, or global warming a great deal. Um, we can see certain trends of uh, dipping during times of uh, potential economic crises in the United States. You see up at uh, 2008, it's one of those high points on a cycle going down to 52 and then 51 percent with the uh, recession uh, around 9-11 as well. Uh, 2001, you start to see a trend uh, dipping down overall of concern about climate change as a whole. Gallup polls also asked Americans what their opinion uh, about when the effects of global warming would happen. And uh, many Americans uh, were of the belief that it had already begun. Uh, that the effects of global warming were already being witnessed across the globe. Uh, others thought that this might happen at a future time, and uh, those in the minority thought that the um, climate change or global warming would never happen. The uh, official uh, news reports or news reports about global warming, it's also interesting to note here that many uh, Americans feel that these are uh, exaggerated in uh, nature and you can see that this uh, uh, really uh, starts to be a, a major trend um, after uh, 2007 going to 2008 uh, and then through 2009 and 2010 and I think this is uh, if you look at the film climate of doubt you will see some of the efforts to cast doubt on the work that climatologists were doing and along with that doubt uh, into this notion of 97 or 98 percent scientific consensus on the issue of climate change you start to see a backpedaling of politicians as their constituents um, rise up against this notion of policies and laws that would be put into place to mitigate climate change because of the potential ramifications in terms of cost of jobs, increased in cost of living, increased in taxes overall. And again, the Climate of Doubt film is, I think, rather illustrative of, of this particular time period and actually what's happening within the United States uh, at, during this time period. The perception of what scientists believe about global warming. Um, you can see that most Americans believe uh, that scientists believe um, that uh, global warming is occurring. Um, that is a very clear trend uh, from what the data indicate of scientific consensus uh, regarding uh, climate change at being at 97 or 98 um, percent. Most scientists are unsure. That's been about 28 uh, percent as of 2013. And then 6% say most believe that it is not occurring. So it's a very small minority of Americans as a whole. The other question that comes into play here is what role do human beings play in the environment as a whole? And, and what are the impacts of humanity on such a large, uh, uh, on the planet as a whole? Can humans really impact systems, uh, ecological systems, across the globe as a whole. And uh, it's interesting here that most Americans do uh, agree with the, uh, the notion that the primary cause uh, is through um, human activities. Um, and that's the primary cause of uh, processes and increases in the Earth's temperature over the last century. Uh, 
with about anywhere between, and you can see right there um, during the 2010 time.